we are going to bring our cameras into his California prison and talk to him about some extraordinary changes in his life. We're in one of America's toughest maximum security prisons. At the end of this corridor is serial killer Ed Kemper. But beyond the headlines, beyond the notorious crimes, is a man who turned himself over to God 20 years ago. I'm told by the guards when he first came here he was so violent that it took many guards to get him into a cell. And off and on he was in solitary confinement for two years. But today he is a man at peace, transformed because of the grace of God. Join me as we hear from Ed Kemper and meet him face to face. And you be the judge. Thank you, Ed, for talking with us today. How long have you been in prison? 17 years. Did you believe in God when you first came to prison? When I first came to prison, I had been a baptized Christian, a fundamentalist uh, Protestant Christian on the streets uh, some years before. And I got caught up in a lot of trinkets, a lot of flashy things, uh, involvements that were not Christian, that were not wholesome and I completely fell away from my faith and from my devotion to Christ. When I came to prison, there was a lot of distraction in here too, but also there was a lot of time to contemplate, a lot of time to think about all the damage that had happened to me and people around me because of my attitude, because of life out there, distractions out there, and not facing up to some real problems I needed to deal with. As you know, much has been written about you. When you first came to prison, you were described as a monster, a maniac. How different is the Ed Kemper before our camera today? Um, it's possible for people to be more relaxed with me than with some other people. Um, it might well be thought to be an uptight situation. I'm a very large person, six foot nine, weigh about 350 pounds. And you would think someone that large is going to be prone toward violence and aggression and uh, overbearing personality. And I'm working toward quite the opposite. So I'd, I would say the difference between 16, 17 years ago where I was considered friendly and easygoing person, that was a facade. Now it's real. Are you concerned about what people on the street think of you? People on the streets that could be of great benefit to the repeated at least once come on let, let me rephrase that from your early childhood and a mother who at the very least mentally abused you to the victims families who in some instances have hated you. How do you deal with all this negativity? That's one thing that those emotions being spent on a person brings to the fore is the, whether you have an ability to deal with it or not. And if you don't, you learn one or you fall because it's a real trap. Hatred, uh, revenge, vengeance, uh, retribution. It's interesting how often people say that that's the Greek way. They put some class to it and say, that's a classic Greek uh, statement that uh, at least with the revenge there's some kind of solace and I don't really believe that I think that's a cop-out and it's easy for me to say that being a violent criminal in, in my past but I haven't had to deal with feelings directly related to murder to retribution to forgiveness in all of my life until I became this until I lived this for 17 solid years in fact 22 out of the last 25 years and uh, I'm in for life I'm doing life I'm not satisfied with that I accept it it's something it took a long time to accept and I'm not serving a sentence but I'm not trying to beat anyone out of the retribution I'm living a life I won't waste a life again you came to Christ at the point you accepted responsibility for all the murders yet I understand it happened in an unlikely place where was that in the hole, 
doing time in the lockup. Um, I could just squander my life away, waste it away to, to nothing, quietly die in a little corner or start living my life. And it was over a period of months. It was very ugly. It's the worst place I've ever lived in my life and it's the best place I've ever lived because during that three years there, I came to grips with myself, with my feelings, with who I was. I became a human being for the first time in my life instead of a caricature. What would your life be like without Jesus Christ? If Christ were not in my life now, if peace were not in my life, if love were not in my life, I'd probably be dead. If I weren't, I'd be wishing I was dead. Although you will probably never be released, you once told me that if you got out, you'd go far away. Where? There's a lot of missionary work out there. And a lot of people in the world that don't know Christ and won't know Christ unless people lay down the comforts and the fun things, the fast cars, the nifty watches, and the cute girlfriends, and the telephones, and go somewhere where the mosquitoes are as big as hummingbirds, and the alligators bite, and uh, share the word, and share the peace, and ask them to exchange ritual and tradition and history for something that works with other peoples. I understand that part of what helped you dedicate your life to Christ was the faithfulness of a Christian volunteer who visited you through a prison ministry called M2. Tell us about that. The uh, people close to me, family members and uh, close friends, drifted away over the years. They had other things to do than to drag into prison continually. So for a period of time I had very few or no visits at all from the outside. And the way I learned about Match 2 was by word of mouth. I knew a few people involved with it here and had seen a few in the visiting room earlier in the years. So I got an application, filled it out, and talked to one of the representatives from the outside, came in to see me. And one thing that was remarkable about that, and it's remained that way since, a remarkable thing is that that man came to my housing unit, to my wing, to my cell, to talk to me. And the notice I got of that meeting said, please be on your wing at your house. See, people familiar with the nomenclature in here, we don't like to call it a cell. It isn't a cell, it's our house. It's where we live. It's not where we do time. It's where we live our lives. And that's rather than sensitive to reality, I'd like to think that that's dealing with reality. We're either serving time or we're living our lives. And you either do it wastefully or you do it usefully. The man wanted to come see me in my house. And for a civilian to come inside and to come right in where we live was meaningful to me. It meant quite a bit. That touched me as very sincere. And I've known the man some years now, and it's, uh, that's never wavered. It sounds like the faithfulness of this Christian man had a great impact on you. My match two sponsors, very short man. He's not even average in height. He's very slender. He's a businessman and not at all imposing. And we get along quite well, um, very well, in fact. He's a very dear friend of mine after just a few months. The man is sincere, he's honest, he cares, and he's here to learn, too. It started out a bit shaky because he was scared. This is prison. It was his first prison. I was his first matchup. And I'm a no court, notorious criminal. People talk about monster this and maniac that. What is the most difficult aspect of your incarceration? It's hard to answer what it is that's I've lost the most. I'd say lost touch with where I would have been or might have been had I still been in society those 17 years. Have there been times of deep sadness, even desperation? It had been a rat race, it's, which I guess is uh, an overused term, but that's what it felt like to me, like a big race, and all of a sudden it come to a screeching halt, and I was just standing there. And I didn't have any reason to live. I was wavering between suicide and trying not to be violent again, and it was a very violent atmosphere I was in, down in, in, the, uh, in the hole. And the violence down there is like 65% higher than it is on the main line of a prison, so it's hard to avoid that. And it's so easy to fall into the suicidal trip that uh, it's scary. How do you survive? Two ways, with Christ and without. Uh, when I first came to prison, I had a lot of notoriety attached to myself and my case. And 
first three years in prison were in what we call the hole in the uh, adjustment center in the prison. And I spent probably the first year of that in what I saw as the blackest pit of my life. Uh, the state had put me in a little concrete room. I had a garment to keep from freezing, some food to keep from starving, a place to deposit it when I was done with it. And that was it. And I was told that's what I needed to live. And I guess the most shocking thing was all my life, being especially a California person, I'd been listening to uh, media conversation about you need this, you have to have that. You just can't live without this product or this item or this support system. I'd heard that all my life and now I sat in a little concrete room and I was told by people that were in authority that that's all I needed to stay alive. And what I found myself doing was facing myself for the first time in my life. And at that time I was 24 years old. Do you have many opportunities to share your faith in Christ with the other inmates? Yes, I'm able to share Christ in here in prison with other people, um, both other Christians and people who feel pain when the issue of Christ comes up, when the issue of mercy and love comes up, because it's like a scalding. These people have pain, they have scars, they have bitterness, they don't have ways of resolving that. And to see someone come by with a smile on his face and with peace in his heart, and that radiates, that's painful. And those people tend to be violent or aggressive toward that kind of uh, that kind of an involvement. So if you're going to be a Christian and a genuine one, it's a burden. It's a cross, and that's the cross Christ asks us to bear, is uh, the ridicule or the tempting of other people uh, to sway away from what we've been doing. And rather than try to justify my involvement with Christ and with Christianity, uh, I'd like to see it as a contest. And I think, I, I've learned in the past that uh, with the patience of Christ, and the patience of that love, the other guy does come around. It's not a matter of a game or a contest in that sense, but it's a patience, just a showing that every day it's real, every day the smile's there, every day a sharing is there. And then the man says, wow, Ed, I'm getting out in six months, I'm going home. You're not ever going home and you know it, you've said it. Yet every day you get in a better mood, every day you get a little bit mellower, and every day I get a little more bitter and a little more burnt out. What's the answer? There it is. Thank you, Ed.